And Father, that's why we're here this morning. Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, you are so worthy to receive all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. Lord, would you meet us now in this place? Would you speak to us through your word? God, do a work in our lives this morning. We love you. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a beautiful wet morning this morning. 15% <laughs> chance of rain. I love it. I think it's a little bit more than 15% chance of rain. Why don't you turn to your neighbor from a distance and say, it is good for you to be here this morning. It is very good for you guys. I see you guys way over there. Daniel B is heading out. It's good for you to be here, Daniel B. He's heading out. Happy birthday again to Will. I saw on Facebook. It's a Facebook birthday, so I saw that on Facebook. I mean, look at this. This is way more than 15%. You told me 45. Jay told me. I got I to gotta triple it. It's up to 45. Well, right now, it's definitely 100%. 100% chance of rain right now. Alrighty. As you guys, yeah, come come in. Just there's plenty of room right over here. Move closer so you're not getting wet out there in those of you in the back. Come in a little bit. See, see Camilla, you were right. You just had to move a little bit over because it's just a little bit wet under here, under the tents this morning. Those of you in your cars, I mean the the rain is blowing this way, so you're totally fine out there. For all of you guys in your cars. You sure Santokis, do you want to move in? I mean, you only have that one umbrella. Anyways, as you guys are making your way to your seats, as you, I want you to think on this question. Think on this question. Who has God called to service? Who has God called to service? What do you think? Who has God called to service? Give me, give me, give me one. Okay, don't listen to Phil. <laughs> He's cheating. He's seen my notes. He got up here. He was reading them before. <laughs> but Phil is absolutely correct. If you did, you hear what he said. Did you all hear what he said? Phil said all of us are called to service. And I think that this is interesting because when we ask this question, who is called to service? Usually, Phil. Usually, you know. But you're much older and wiser than than a lot of these younger guys here. Usually, we think what? We think, oh, the pastor. God has called the pastor to service. What about missionaries? God has called missionaries to service. And then we start to think, well, assistant pastors, worship leader, youth leader, Sunday school teachers, ushers, greeters, all of these things, God has called them to service. We go through what we call the visible ministries of the church. God has called these guys to service, these women to service. And it's, if you thought any of those things, you would be correct, because God does indeed call all of those individuals to serve in those ministries. But Phil, right off the bat, is absolutely correct that anyone who names the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, anyone who is an authentic Christian, who has been made alive because of Jesus Christ on the cross, because of what Jesus did, the blood shed on the cross, the resurrection three days later, every single person that names the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior is called to serve, is called to minister. And where are we called to minister? I'm going to give you three different ones. The first one is we're called to minister in the church. Every single one of us is called to serve in the church. The second one is every single one of us is called to serve in the world. And the third one, where does service in the church and service in the world have its roots? It all begins in the home that the service first begins in the home. Notice, I'll give you three passages this morning. The first one is for the church. First Corinth, or First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, it says this, now you, you, and when Paul says you, what he's saying is any of you who are authentic Christians, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. If you think about your physical body, every part of your physical body serves the entirety of the body in some way. When a part of your body doesn't serve the body, what do you want to do? You want to get rid of that part of the body. I'll tell you a story. I love stories. There was, I was, this was back in the day. I had just graduated from high school. I was still living with my parents. They still had that room downstairs. That room downstairs is, is a different room now. It's been totally remodeled by the Cokies. Anyways, I was sleeping, great sleep. I woke up, and when I woke up, there was a hand that was directly on my face. And I'm like, what? I'm thinking in my head, 
what is this hand doing on my face? I mean, what's going on here? Why is there a hand on my face? I don't recall anyone coming in here last night. And so I, I pick up the hand. Like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, what is this hand? And I'm, I'm holding it above my face and I'm just looking at it, examining this hand. And I let it go. And it falls right back on my face. <laughs> and I was just like, what is going on? And I'm looking at him. And so I'm like, I realize as I'm examining this hand, this is a man's hand. <laughs> and what do you, I, I threw that hand, I threw the hand off of my face. And as it flies that way, I see it's attached to my arm. I was like, oh, that's my hand. <laughs> it had totally fallen asleep. It was totally useless. It didn't had, it served no purpose in my body at that moment. It, and then you know what happens when your hand wakes up, right? You get that tingling, burning sensation and all the sharp needles. And you're like, ah! We're part of the body of Christ. We're so, and the same is true spiritually. Every single one of us is called to serve. If your hand is not working, if you are called as a hand in the body of Christ and you are not serving as a hand, you're just like my hand that morning, absolutely useless. Everybody wondering, your brain is wondering, well, what are you doing, man? What is this thing doing that's attached to your body? It's absolutely useless. And so we're brought, we have to understand very clearly that we're brought into the body of Christ in order to use the gifts that God has given us to serve the body. And it's not all visible ministries. There are lots of ways to come in and serve the body. And many of those ways are ways that nobody ever sees. One of the greatest things that we can do to serve the body is to be prayer warriors. Mr. San was a prayer warrior. He was one that would pray every day for us. And I know that there are several of you out there that serve the body as prayer. I mean, guys, we're brought in to use our gifts to build up and serve the body. Are we plugged into a ministry? Are we using our gifts in the local church? Because that is what we are called to do. You are the body of Christ. You are individually part of something way bigger than yourselves. Pastor Rick would always say that, right? We're part of something way bigger than us. <laughs> and we are. We are just part of the local body here. But there's also the global body. That God is doing a work not just in Mililani, in this community. God is doing a work in Wahiwa. God is doing a work in Eva Beach. God is doing a work across the United States of America. God is doing a work across the globe. And we're part of that. We are part of something way bigger than ourselves. I mean, you're going to hear in a couple weeks, two, two weeks, I think Pastor Clay is going to come and share in two weeks about what God is doing in our nation. I'm excited for him to come and share that there's going to be a special message that he has. The Lord has put this thing on his heart. And God, guys, God is doing a work across our nation. And it's an absolute, this is the time for us to be part of the body, to be plugged in. And so we're see we're and we're not only to be serving the body of Christ, we're also to be serving the Lord out in the world. You guys know one of my favorite verses in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says this, Therefore, we, each of us as individuals who has named the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are ambassadors for Christ. It doesn't say there are a select few who are ambassadors for Christ. It doesn't say that the, the pastors are ambassadors for Christ, the missionaries are ambassadors, the ushers are ambassadors. No, it says we, anyone who's named the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, is an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That we have, we serve God in the world as his ambassadors we go out into the world and we show that god changes lives and that there is hope in the name of jesus that this is what we are called to do to be ambassadors to a lost and hurting world that jesus christ can save what has jesus done in your life Lorena was sharing this week in our devotional times that we're called to share our testimony with lost and hurting world. Share the amazing things that God has done in your lives. And so we see we're called in the church to serve. We're called to serve in the world. And where does it all begin? It begins very simply in the home. And the passage for the home, you guys, I'm not going to read the entirety of the passage, but it's Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. We see very clearly husbands were to what? Love our wives. Wives were to submit to our husbands. Children, we are to obey our parents, that there is an order that's happening in the home. And this is where it all begins for us, that we, we look at that calling, right? 
You look at the calling. Husbands, you look at it. You're called to love. Wives, you look at the calling. The calling to submit. Children, you look at the calling. The calling to obey. And then we look at a calling of an ambassador. We look at a calling of being plugged in in the body. And what do we say? We say, this is absolutely impossible. I can't do it. And again, you would be absolutely right. Because in your own strength, it is absolutely impossible to walk in the calling that God has called you to. In your own strength, it is absolutely impossible. So we know, <laughs> if it's not my strength, whose strength is it? It's the Lord's strength that we have to be filled with the Spirit to accomplish any of these three ministries, these three callings that God has called us to. And this is what Paul is going to talk to us about this morning. He's going to show us that it's only through the Spirit that service is an absolute miracle of God. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me. First Timothy chapter one, we're right there in verse 12 this morning. I'm reading out of the ESV. It says this, I thank him who has given me strength. I thank God who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Church, the only way that we can be faithful in the ministry that God has called us, that God has appointed us to, is to be filled with the very Spirit of God. You guys know this is probably a verse that you guys have learned when you were very young. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, I can do what? All. It doesn't say I can do some, I can do a few, I can do this, that, or the other. It says I can do all things. How? Through him who gives me strength. That everything is possible. Every ministry is possible only through the strength provided by the Holy Spirit. Every ministry, whether it's ministry in the church, whether it's ministry in the world, whether it's ministry in the home, is only possible through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. We can do it only is as we're filled with the very Spirit of God. And so, man, when God fills us, he gives us the strength, he gives us the energy needed for the task at hand. God has given us everything necessary for life and for godliness. And so how does he judge us faithful? Because, I mean, how does God judge you faithful? You know, it can't be in your own strength because you know in your own strength you are so unfaithful. When was the last time you tried to do something in your own strength? How did that go? It usually, I mean, <laughs> it might go okay for a moment or two, but it will always end terribly. When we try to do things in our own power and in our own strength, it will always end terribly. And so Jesus talks about, he says, what does it mean to be found faithful? What does that look like for us to be found faithful to the Lord? God gives us a parable. We know it is the, the parable of the minas. You remember the parable of the minas? The minas? <laughs> you remember the parable? It's in Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to read you two verses. I'm going to read you verse 16 and 17. You remember the Lord had given all his servants... He had given them a mina. He said, okay, go and do business till I return. And so now the Lord comes back and the first servant comes up to him. This is what it records in Luke 19, 16 through 17. The first servant, the first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. This parable teaches us something. This parable teaches, it teaches us what it means to be judged faithful. It means that we are faithful to do something with the investment that God himself has made in us. Being found faithful means that we are faithful to do something with the investment that God has made in you. What investment has God made in you? You can go look at Ephesians chapter 2. The very first investment God made in you is he made you alive. That you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And God made you alive. It was an investment. He's filled you with his spirit. He's given you the filling of the very spirit of God, the creator of heavens and earth. He's filled you with his spirit. He's given you all energy and power necessary for the trials and the tasks of life. The real question then becomes, are you doing something with the spirit that God has given you? Are you walking it out in reality? The spirit that God has given you, are you doing something with it? 
And that's a question for self-evaluation. And usually when we start to evaluate ourselves on if I am doing something with the investment that God has made in it, in me, one of two things happen. I usually, I can become encouraged. Why? Because I'm doing something with the investment that God has made in me. I can become encouraged as I see God producing fruit in my life. And I can say, wow, God, you are doing exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think. The second thing that can happen is we become discouraged. Why would we be discouraged when we evaluate ourselves? Well, maybe it's because we haven't been doing what God has called us to do. Maybe it's because we haven't been serving in the church. Maybe it's because we haven't been ambassadors to the world. Maybe it's because in our homes that things are not going according to Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 and we know we're not doing what God has called us to do in that area. And there becomes a little bit of condemnation from the enemy. And we look at it and we're like, we start to get bummed out like, man, I just can't do it. You don't know the sin. It's too hard. This thing, this challenge is too difficult. It's impossible for me to do. And I love Paul. Because Paul says, I've just told you this command. I've given you this command that ministry is necessary, that we need to be found faithful with the investment that God has made in us. And we need to do it in his strength. But there are people out there who find it just absolutely still impossible. They think, man, I just can't do it. It's too hard. And so what does Paul do? He says, let me share with you. Let me encourage you with my own testimony. Because here's the thing. What we have to understand is that service to the Lord is a miracle. Just as salvation is a miracle, service in the church, in the world, and at home is an absolute miracle of God. It takes the very nature and power of God in us to walk this out in reality. It is an absolute miracle. And so Paul wants to encourage us and he says, let me share with you my testimony so that you can see the miracle that service is because if god can use paul god can use anyone if god can save paul god can save anyone and so what does he say listen to what he says verse 13 though formerly i was a blasphemer a persecutor an insolent opponent but i received mercy because i had acted ignorantly in unbelief paul had been a blasphemer what does that mean that means he had sinned against God. Just the bottom line. Paul says, I was an absolute sinner against God. I was an enemy of the Lord. And then he says, I was a persecutor. What does that mean? Well, what that means is very clear. I was an enemy of those around me. I was a sinner against the people that were in my life. And then he says that I was an insolent opponent. And the, our, our idea of insolent opponent now would be what we would call a bully. You guys remember bullies? You have to think back maybe going, going to elementary school. There was always the class bully. That, was just, that would just do whatever he wanted to do. And, and maybe now class bullies are, are she's now. I don't, usually when I was growing up, it was only boys. But now there's probably some girl class bullies. But that's what it means that Paul could do nothing right before God. Paul could do nothing right before man. What did Paul deserve? What did Paul deserve? You know what Paul deserved? Judgment. That's what Paul deserved. He deserved to be judged by God. But the reality of it is, every single one of us deserved to be judged by God. There's not a one of us here that didn't deserve what Paul deserved to be judged by God. Because we had all sinned against God, maybe not to the extent that Paul had, but we had all sinned against God. We had all sinned against our fellow man. And usually the ones we sin against are those who are closest to us. And we had all been a bully at times. We might not have been the class bully, but at times we were probably bullies, throwing our weight around when we shouldn't have. And all of us deserve judgment just like Paul. But what did Paul receive? He didn't receive judgment. What did he receive? He received mercy. Look at what he says. He says, I deserve judgment, but I got mercy. Why? Because I repented. And this is the thing that we've learned in Jonah. When you repent, what does God do? He forgives. 1 John 1, 9 is very clear. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He got mercy because he, for, he asked for forgiveness. He repented there on the road to Damascus. And what happened? Salvation is an absolute miracle. Notice what Paul says about salvation in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This is a picture of salvation. What happens when salvation occurs? That the grace of our Lord overflows into you with 
with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. That is a picture of the miracle of salvation. What does it mean? I love what John Stott says. John Stott says this, grace overflowed. What does that mean? It, it's like a river in spate, which cannot be contained, but bursts its banks and carries everything before it, sweeping irresistibly on. What the river of grace brought with it, however, was not devastation, but blessing. The river of grace in our lives doesn't bring devastation, it brings blessing, in particular, faith and love. Stott says the Nile overflows, the crops abound, grace overflowed, and faith and love will spring up. Grace flooded with faith, a heart previously filled with unbelief. All of a sudden, Paul's heart filled with unbelief because of the grace of the Lord is now filled with faith and belief in God and flooded with love, a heart previously polluted with hatred. That grace came in and a heart polluted with hatred towards God and towards man is all of a sudden overflowed with the love of Christ. This is an absolute miracle of miracles that God changes us completely. That our unbelief is turned to faith in Christ. That our hatred towards God and towards our fellow man, that I, I know okay a lifestyle, that I'm going to do what I like, is changed to love towards God and love to our fellow man. This is an absolute miracle that God changes us radically and completely. That he, and then the, I mean, he, he calls us to service. An absolute miracle of Christ. The gospel is God's miracle for the world. And what, I mean, he's one of the greatest statements of the gospel is found in verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. This is a statement of, this is the, probably one of the greatest statements of the good news. What does it say? It says, first thing that we see, is that this gospel, this gospel is trustworthy. This gospel is true. We, if you examine the world, if you would examine yourself, you would see the, the, that the gospel is necessary. Why? Because if you examine your heart, you know in your soul that you are a sinful individual. You're a sinful man. You're a sinful woman. And there's a punishment for your sin. It's separation from God. We know this. This is true. Look out in the world. Those people who say that, uh, the, what is it, the psychologists, psychiatrists that say the world is, every one of us is just, we're all good people inside. Every one of us is a good person. And this world is getting better and better. I think it was on the news this week. Portland is over 100 days straight of violent protests. I mean, violence. Those, that's, that's the sign that the world is getting better and better. Wow, it's just a couple of bad apples ruling the whole, whole bunch. No, because you know in your heart of hearts that there's no good that dwells in here. That every single one of us is separated from God. That there's a punishment. We know we're sinners. We know that there's a punishment for our sins. We know that this is true. And then we hear the good news that God knew that it was true as well. And God said, I know this is true. I know you can do nothing to save yourself. And so I'm going to send Jesus Christ, myself, Emmanuel, God with us, God to the rescue, to save you from your sins. He's going to die in your place. He's going to take the punishment that you deserved, the judgment that you deserved, and he's going to give you mercy by dying on the cross and rising three days later, proving that he has victory over sin and death. And this is available to anyone. And that's the second thing that we see. The second thing that we see is that in order for the death of Christ to be effective in an individual's life, it must be accepted. Paul says very clearly, Paul says very clearly that this gospel is deserving of full acceptance. What he's saying is this gospel is deserving of your acceptance. That it's on an individual level. That as an individual, you decide, am I going to accept what Jesus did for me on the cross? Am I going to accept that he died in my place? Am I going to accept his sacrifice? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That invitation is open to anyone who would accept, anyone who would come to the Lord in humility and accept him as Lord and Savior. 
Because the only question then that really matters is, what are you going to do with Jesus? And there are many that do nothing with Jesus, absolutely reject Jesus. But the question is still there. What are you going to do with Jesus? He came to save sinners, to save you. And if he can save Paul, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent bully, the worst sinner that the world has ever seen is what he calls himself. He can save anyone. He can save the governor. He can save the mayor. He can save any number of these officials. He can save anyone who would come to him in humility. Any single person that would come to him in humility is not beyond the reach of the Lord. And he wants to use you to speak truth into their lives. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never in humility, maybe you're watching online and you've never in humility come to the Lord and asked him to be Lord of your life that you are gonna follow him wherever he leads you. You have never personally accepted the gospel. It's not a hard thing to do. Maybe the Lord is calling your heart right now that you're a whosoever. What does it entail to come to the Lord? It entails three simple things. Admitting that you are a sinful person and repenting of that sin, saying, Lord, I am sorry for the sin I have done against you and against my fellow man. It's believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, taking your place on the cross. And it's confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. This is doing business with God. This is coming to the Lord. It's a very simple prayer. It's you and your heart doing business with God. And maybe you're online, maybe you're here, and you've never done that. The opportunity is now. It's a simple prayer. You could repeat it after me. Father, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I repent of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking my place. I confess that you are Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And for anyone who would pray a simple prayer like that, for anyone who would in their hearts do business with God, there's only one thing to say. Welcome to the family. <laughs> because you would be part of the body of Christ. If you prayed that prayer, come talk to us after church. If you were online and you prayed that prayer, contact me, contact Lorena, contact Pastor Clay or Lisa, contact one of the elders, because welcome to the family. We want to encourage you to now grow in the foundation of Jesus Christ, because here's the great news, that salvation is an absolute miracle of God, but not only salvation, because there is a purpose. Service is now an absolute miracle of God. Notice what Paul is going to say about service. He says, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Goodness gracious, like Paul, any authentic Christian is an example to others, that as we authentically live for God, others, whether they're in our home, Maybe they're in our church. Maybe they're in the world. Others will see what God is doing in us. When we authentically follow the Lord, the Lord isn't content just to save us, but he wants to change us. And he knows that the change that is necessary and required is an absolute miracle. That the unbelief that was in your heart has to be miraculously changed to faith. That the hatred and anger that was in your heart has to be miraculously changed to love. And the only way to do that is Jesus Christ. The only way to do that is the Lord. And so as the Lord does this radical change in us, others take notice. Others begin to see. They begin to see that God is doing something. What is God doing? What is going on in so-and-so? Why? Why do they love people? Why are they doing the things that they're doing? And they ask you about it, and all of a sudden you have opportunity to be an ambassador for Christ, that you can share with others what God has done in you. And it's a miracle that God not only saves us, but that God then calls us to service, and he uses us as an example so that others can hear about what God has done, so that others can hear about Jesus Christ, and that others can be radically saved, that they can repent, that they can have hope, just like we have hope as a church, that they can follow the Lord, that they can come to know him. 
What more can be said? Well, look at what Paul does at this point. He breaks forth in, in, in praise. There's nothing more that can be said. Paul breaks forth in praise and he says to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. There's nothing else that can be said. Salvation is an absolute miracle of God. The cross is a miracle of God. Service is an absolute miracle of God that God wants to use you, a former blasphemer, a former persecutor, a former bully, to be an ambassador, to reach others with the gospel. That God wants to do that in you is an absolute miracle. And so Paul breaks forth and says, I did nothing. All I did was repent. God did everything. Praise the Lord that he's the king of the ages. This is one of my favorite sayings because what it's talking about is that God exists outside of time. That time is a creation of God. And therefore, because time is a creation of God, he was there before time was created and he was there after time is created. It's like if you had this watch, if you were the creator of, of these watches. You exist before, you exist after, you can see this watch and that's, that's your little creation. It's like time for the Lord. The Lord is standing outside of time and therefore sees all of time before it's even happened. He's seen it. He's seen it from the beginning to the very end. He's standing outside of time. But the amazing thing about God standing outside of time is that when Jesus Christ, he still subjected himself to time. He came so that he could understand. He understands what it's like to be constrained by time, to live in time. He understands what, his, what it's like to be human. And he's free to act at the perfect time. So many times we sit there and say, God, why aren't you moving? God, why isn't this happening the way that I want it to happen? Don't you see that you're out of time? God is never out of time. Never. He's always going to act at the right time, at the perfect time. But what is this? In the fullness of time. Jesus Christ came, the exact right time God will act in the way that brings him the glory and is for our good. God will always work in time. The second thing is he's immortal. Death does not touch him. Decay, death and decay do not touch the Lord. He is absolutely immortal. He does what happens to our mortal bodies. I'm gonna tell you what happens to our mortal bodies, time. <laughs> And as time occurs to a mortal body, what happens to that mortal body? It begins to break down. <laughs> and we begin to lose our strength. We begin to gain weight in places where weight had never been before. You look at those young men that are sitting up there and you're like, I wish I could go back in time and be 20 again to be 150 pounds and not have to worry about these things that are growing. I can't eat the way that I used to eat. I want to go to McDonald's every day, but I cannot. <sighs> I'm not immortal. I'm under the constraints of mortality. I will lose strength as time goes on. I will lose energy as time goes on. But death and decay, loss of strength due to time, do not affect the Lord. He's invisible. We cannot see him. And yet here's the amazing thing, that even though we cannot see God, he's revealed himself to us through his word. This absolutely, you look out into creation this morning, and maybe it'll happen even now. This morning, there was a beautiful rainbow. As the rain was coming and the sun was shining, there's a beautiful rainbow. And what does the rainbow represent? It represents that God will never flood and destroy the earth with water again. Creation. God reveals himself through creation. And that blows my mind. And what is it? He's the only God. He has no equal or rival, and therefore he's worthy of all honor, praise, and glory. And we must worship him. If he's the only God, the, the only thing we can do in response to that is worship him. But here's the thing. There are people who today will refuse to worship him, and they think, I don't need to worship the Lord. He doesn't exist. He's not real. Absolutely not true. You can worship the Lord now, or you, you can choose to refuse. But there is a day that is coming when all of us will bow before the Lord. Even if you didn't want to do it here on the earth, there will come a day when you'll bow before the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, you guys know this one. It says this, so that at the name of Jesus, at the end, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a time where we will confess that Jesus is Lord and at that time we'll be rejoicing but there will be those who have rejected the Lord here on this earth that will not be rejoicing. They will bow the knee but they'll be bowing the knee there at the great white throne of judgment. And I do not want anyone to go to the great white throne of judgment. And so there has to be that thought that Christ is pleading through us, that we're ambassadors of Christ. And so because of Paul's testimony and example, what is Timothy to do? What are we to do because of Paul's testimony and example? Verse 18, this charge I entrust to you because you've heard my testimony, because you've seen that salvation is an absolute miracle because you've seen that service to God is an absolute miracle. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Timothy, Paul says, my child. And for us, the Holy Spirit says, church, my kids, passionately follow Jesus. You have seen the mighty power of God in salvation. You have seen the mighty power of God in service. You have seen the mighty power of God in your own life. Remember the amazing things that God has done for you. What are the amazing things that God has done in your life? Remember, church, what is it? The amazing things that you have seen God do in your life. Remember it. And therefore, as you think on these things, as you think of the miracle of salvation, the miracle of service, the miracle of prophecy, and people speaking God's truth into your life, when was the last time somebody spoke the word of God into your life and you knew it was for you? When was the last time you spoke the word of God into somebody's life that the Lord gave you a verse for someone and you spoke that word of God into somebody's life and man, it was like that fresh <laughs> wind that was blowing into them and you could see the spirit working. You've seen the power of God is what Paul says. You've seen it. Therefore, fight, battle. Don't give up. Stand firm on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Stand firm on Jesus putting on the full armor of God each and every day. There's, these are challenging days. These are evil days. You have to be firm on your foundation. You have to put on the full armor of God. And how are we to fight? Paul says two very specific things. Holding faith and a good conscience. Hold on to faith. This is a nautical idea of holding on. That you are holding on to faith in the storm that's raging all around you. That you're on that, have you ever watched those the ships in a storm? Those waves just coming and breaking over those ships? I can only imagine being in like a wooden ship back in the day in one of those storms. I would be like, like Noah, I'd be crying out to the Lord, Lord save me. These big metal ships, they just go right through these things. It's holding on to faith. What is faith? I love what Pastor Rick would always tell us. What would Pastor Rick tell us about faith? He would say, church, faith is a verb. What does that mean, faith is a verb? Because Pastor Rick would say it means two things. It means, first of all, faith means that you believe in your heart. What do you believe? You believe the very word of God, which means you have to be in the word of God to believe the word of God. In order to believe something, you have to know what it says. You can't just believe, I'm not, I'm, I believe in the Word of God. Well, what does the Word of God say? Do you know it? Are you in the Word of God daily? Pastor Rick would encourage us, and faith is a verb. You must first believe. Believe God's Word by being in God's Word every day. And second, it means taking action. It means when God speaks to you through His Word, when you see the commands of God in his word, you take action. You go and do something because of what God has showed you in his word. This is the essence of faith, what Pastor Rick would share with us. And as we walk out in faith, in God's word, believing God's word, acting on his word, we will have a good conscience. Why? Because our faith will be evidenced in reality. That's what it means to have a good conscience, that we're looking back and we're seeing God's 
work it in our lives. We're seeing God produce fruit in our lives. We're seeing God do them exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think in our lives. That we have a good conscience before God, that we see that the things that are going on are done in the energy and power of the Lord. This is a good conscience. What we say and what we do prove that we are filled with the very Spirit of God. Is there evidence in our lives by what we say and what we do that we are filled with the very Spirit of God? If you were before a court, Pastor Rick would always tell us this one too when he's talking about faith. He would say, if you went before a judge, would there be enough evidence to convict you, to convict a jury that you are a Christian? Because being a Christian, I mean, it's not just about what we say, it's about what we do. It's about working in the energy and power of the Lord, fulfilling our personal ministry in the power of the Spirit. Because the reality is so simple, guys. False teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, they, they talk. They'll talk, 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 talk. And many of them will sound really good. They know some Christianese words. They can say some verbs. They can use some language. They sound really great. And yet their actions show that they do not have authentic faith in Jesus Christ. They might say that they believe the word of God. And yet when they start going out and doing things, it goes absolutely against what God says in his word. Blows my mind. Wait, what? This is what the word of God says and this is what you're doing. They're two different things. It's somebody who's following false doctrine. Their actions are showing that they do not have an authentic faith in God. What does Paul say about these guys? He says, by rejecting this, by rejecting faith, by rejecting a good conscience, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That their faith is an absolute shipwreck. Why? I love what MacArthur says. MacArthur says this, bad theology has its roots in bad morals. Those who teach error do so in order to substitute a system that accommodates their sin. What is he saying? He's saying very clearly, those who teach error do so because they don't want to give up their sinful life. Those we can add to that, those who follow error do so because they don't want to give up their sinful life. And so following false teaching or teaching false falsely happens for one reason, we love our sin. And when we love our sin, we're gonna, as Paul would write later, he would say, you're gonna heap up teachers for yourselves. You're gonna have itching ears. You're gonna look for somebody that's gonna tell you something that you wanna hear. You're not gonna look for the very words of God because you don't care. You want somebody to give you some watered down gospel. You want somebody to tell you, man, if you follow Jesus, you're gonna be healthy, wealthy, and pros prosperous for the rest of your life. You want some crazy idea of the gospel. That's not absolutely true. Why? Because you love your sin. You don't want to deal with it. That's why I love Tozer's devotional. I put it in the shepherd to the sheep. It talked about very clearly, if you are going to follow God, you have to turn from your sin. False teachers and people who will follow false teaching want to follow God, want to say that they're going to heaven and yet still follow sin. And they find a teacher that'll tell them, yeah, you can do that. You're totally fine. MacArthur would say, you are in big trouble. Paul would say, you're in big trouble. You've turned away from the faith. You might know the word of God, but it's not evidenced in reality. Your conscience is your own conscience. Your actions are betraying you that you are not an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. We have to repent. There's... There's secret sins that every single one of us, we secretly love. There was a book I was reading um, back when I was in CEF. It was called My Heart Christ's Home. Some of you might, it was just a little tiny pamphlet book. And it talked about how every room in our house was like, they had a spiritual meaning. Here's the meaning of this room and that room. And, and the last room that they talked about was the hall closet. Why? Because it's usually the hall closet where you throw all your junk when people come over. <laughs> Do you have a closet like that at home where you're like, people are coming over quick, put everything into this closet and close that thing up and then nobody's going to see the mess that's really inside of our house. My Heart Cries Home had talked about this hall closet and says that hall closet is where we put our secret sins. 
the sins that we secretly love, that we secretly don't want to give up. And yet, the Lord is asking, he says, I need to clean out that hall closet. Eli, I need to clean out that hall closet. Lorena, I need to clean out that hall closet. Pastor Clay, I need to clean out that hall closet. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, we still have a hall, we still have a, a hall closet. Why, how do I know? Because David, probably one of the most called a man after God's own heart, says in Psalm 139, search me, God. Search my house, try me. See if there is any way, wicked way in me. He says, please see, is there a whole closet? Is there something that I'm hiding, that I think I'm hiding from you? Because there's times where we think we're hiding something from the Lord and we're not hiding it from the Lord at all. He sees, he knows exactly what's in the whole closet. And I love David's cry, he says, and lead me in the way everlasting. That he wants to repent of that hall closet even before he knows what it is. We have to repent, church. We have to repent because false teachers, man, these guys will say things, but they've just made up a made up a doctrine because they love their hall closet and they don't want to give it up. They love it and they don't want to give it up. And there are people that want to follow them. And as a church, if there are those, there will be those that say, I refuse to repent. I refuse. I'm going to, I'm going to chase after this thing. And what does Paul say? Paul says, for those guys that refuse to repent, hand them over to Satan. You might say, wow, that is, whew, that's heavy. That's, it's talking about church discipline. What, what does it mean when Paul says, hand them over to Satan? We know very clearly he uses the same language in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. He, we know that this means that they, you need to ask them to leave the church. So you can't, you can't come to the church anymore. You're polluting the church. You're bringing the spiritual temperature down of the church with this false teaching and false living that's going on in your life. And so what is the purpose of asking someone to leave the church, to go back into the world? I love what John Stott says about handing someone over to save me. He says this, since the church is the dwelling place of God, it follows that to be ejected from it is to be sent back into the world, the habitat of Satan. Radical though this punishment is, it is not permanent or irrevocable. Its purpose is remedial in the hope that through this discipline, the offenders may be taught not to blaspheme. The implication is that once the lesson has been learned, the excommunicated persons may be restored to fellowship. Paul says, you have to ask them to leave the church for one specific reason so that they can see what it's like to go back and live in the world and they can see that there's no hope living in under Satan's domain and that they could come to their senses, that they would come to their senses and absolutely repent of the things that they have been doing, of those hall closets that they've had, that they would absolutely repent and turn to the Lord and be useful to the Lord in service. And as we finish this morning, there's only a couple things for us to think about. What service has God called you to? As an individual, as we've listened to what Paul has encouraged Timothy with this morning, what service has God called you to? Timothy knew the service that God had called him to. Paul encouraged him to go and be the pastor that God had created him to be at the church in Ephesus, even when it was hard, even when it was almost impossible for him to be filled with the Spirit. What service has God called you to? He doesn't call everyone to be pastors. But I'm going to tell you right now, God has called you to do something in your home. Mike and Kim will tell you all about it. Go talk to them if you, if you need help in your home. They'll talk to you about husbands loving your wives. They'll talk to you about wives submitting to your husbands. They'll talk to you about children obeying your parents. And we all know it from Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. What is God calling you to do in your home? It's one of those three things. What is God calling you to do in church? How is God calling you to serve the local body of Christ? What gifts has God given you? What abilities has God given you? And are you walking in that? And yes, right now, I understand it's hard right now with COVID, right? It's hard with COVID, but there's still areas of service that, that need to be filled. Talk to Pastor Clay if you want to use your giftings in the church. What service are you doing in the world? Every single one of us, you might not go to school anymore, but there are some of us, you young guys, going to school. Most of us go to work. Unless we're retired like my dad, then you just gallivant all over. <laughs> and then, then you're just in the community. <laughs> what service is God calling you to do in one of those areas? Are you walking as an ambassador to Jesus Christ at your work, at your school, in your community? 
Are you walking in it? So this morning, what I'd like us to do, we got to refocus on the Lord. We got to refocus on the cross. We got to refocus on what the Spirit is enabling us to do. Because we cannot do it in our own strength and power. To be faithful in service, we need to be filled with the Spirit. We cannot do it in our own strength. And what we need to do this morning is very simple. Brian will always tell us this, or tell me this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this. Focus back on the Lord. And as you focus back on the Lord, we're going to have communion this morning. And as we focus back on the Lord, as we focus back in on the cross, the first thing that we have to do is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Let a person examine himself. Examine yourself. Is there a secret sin in a hall closet that you haven't let go of? That you haven't opened up the door and said, Lord, I need you to clean out this hall closet. Is there something going on there? Examine yourself. Because if there's something going on there, repent this morning. Repent of what's going on in your, in your house. What is it? And if you don't know of anything that's going on in your house, be like David this morning and cry out, say, Lord, examine me. See if there's any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. Because the Lord wants to do that for us this morning and then meditate this morning. After you've done that, meditate this morning as we sing this song, what has God done in your life? Can you remember? So often we only remember the bad things and we tend to forget the good things. What have you seen God do in your life this morning? Saved my marriage, saved my kids, gave me a future and a hope. I mean, absolute miracles. What has God done in your life? Meditate on that for a moment and then ask the third thing. Ask this morning, God, how do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? And then you have to be honest with the Lord. Lord, I cannot do that in my own strength. I don't have the strength. I don't have the power to do it. Fill me fresh with your spirit this morning, Lord. Give me the strength and energy to do what you've called me to do. So, Father God, in this time, Lord, as we prepare ourselves for communion, Lord, would you continue to work in our lives? Lord, if there's an area where we need to repent, Lord, we come before you humbly this morning and ask to search us, God. Help us as we examine ourselves to repent of those sins that so easy, easily ensnare us, those whole closets, Lord. And God, would you thank you for the things that you've done, your death on the cross. Thank you for what you've done in us and through us. And Lord, show us how we can serve you more. Help us to walk in obedience to your call. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, why don't you guys uh, pass out the elements and, and the rest of us, we can meditate as Jim leads us in this song. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you for the miracle of salvation. We thank you for your death on the cross that made a way for us, that bridged that gulf between God and man, that you did it. Lord, we can't thank you enough for what you've done for us. And so, Lord, this morning, we refocus back on you. We remember your sacrifice, that you gave everything because you loved us. You wanted a relationship with us. Lord, we can't thank you enough. Our, Like Paul, our praise is just, it's only what you deserve. So thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And Lord, continue that work in our lives. Lord, continue to fill us with your spirit. Continue to work in us and through us, God. We want to see, we want to be your ambassadors and see others come to know you as their savior. So work in us, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, you guys can take the bread together. Paul continues and says, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Father God, we thank you for your blood that was shed, that was shed for us there on the cross. 
Lord, as we are here on this beautiful piece of property that you have given us, we declare your death and resurrection until you come again. And Lord, we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We so look forward to in hope and anticipation of that day where we will drink with you in the kingdom, God, where we will see your glory, where we will see you face to face with our own eyes and not with another. So Lord, do that work in us. We thank you. Lord, for the saving work that of salvation, that miracle. And Lord, we pray for that miracle of service. Lord, that you would fill us even now fresh with your spirit, giving us the energy, power, and strength necessary for today's tasks, today's, uh, today's things that you have for us. Would we walk in them? So we love you. We commit ourselves to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can take the cup together. I love proclaiming the name of the Lord until he comes. And that's what we're here to do. Proclaim the name of Jesus until he comes. Why don't you guys stand up? I'm pretty sure that we can do one more song before we head out. We can worship the Lord together before we head out. Have a great week. We'll see you uh, on, on our devotional times. We'll see you at our studies Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Man, lots of studies going on. We'll see you around this week. If not, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless. Have a great week in the Lord.